So in the battle of integration, again, we're going to go back to a familiar place. You start out empty. You know, your God waits for whatever's going to be. He wants to be your body to exit the womb of what's going to become your mother. And then he imputes what's going to be your soul to that body. And that's when you become you. That's Psalm 139. And that's actually verse 16 in Psalm 139. And then verse 17 states why God does it that way. To see how precious are his thoughts. There's the integration. David is integrating his own life and existence with God's. You know, why am I here? That's an integration question. And the answer is to see how precious your thoughts are, oh God. And you wanted me, and, and the funny thing is, I, I really wish they'd cover this because it's so dramatic, a statement of God's love. In Psalm 139, 16, the Hebrew word is golem, and it means fetus. Unfortunately, they mask that because golem is a very specific word. It got a lot of cultural baggage in Hebrew. It's their version of Frankenstein. The Jewish version of Frankenstein. It means a soulless body. That's literally what it means. And there are a lot of like myths in, in Jewish lore about, you know, somebody coming back from the dead and their soul went to heaven, but the body is still on earth and they're just like a, they're a golem. So at both ends of your life, at the, at the fetus in the womb, and then also after you die because your soul goes up to heaven they have these these like fairy tales that they tell that Jewish kids learn from their parents and stuff like that over the centuries of Jewish lore okay so David is taking advantage of that when he uses the word golem and unfortunately they translated unformed substance so you don't understand that what's impressing David in the passage is that you went to all the trouble to to let my body because he, he wasn't him yet there's no David first God as it were and the, the, the Hebrew is saying this it's in I put it I put all the text in no womb life dot htm okay David's impressed because God as it were ordered his body parts David's body parts to be made before David even existed and the only place that David existed was in the mind of God and all that trouble that God went to as it were ordering the body parts to be knitted together in what would be his mother's womb waiting the nine months and all during that time, what's impressing David is, you knew what I would be, you knew what I would do, you knew how I would screw up, and you still waited? You went to all that trouble and waited? Okay? And so he's like, oh, why am I here? To see your precious thoughts. That's verse 17. It's very dramatic. It's beautiful in the Hebrew. And I really wish that they'd cover it. But instead they mistranslate it. And egregious pastors use it to, to... The exact opposite of the meaning of the passage. They use it to campaign against abortion. Making all kinds of vile lies. Totally spitting on Christ. Totally spitting on the Word of God. Especially in that chapter. They use it. Okay, now what am I trying to say here? The integration why is you're a you so that you can see God. And the amazing thing is, is why would God want to see you? But, you know, there's no accounting for taste. You're here, so he does. Okay, and therefore the battle for integration to get to the point where like David you can say oh how precious are your thoughts oh God that battle begins at birth with you being empty and your actual battle for integration is entirely different 
you, you couldn't even understand the concept of God. If somebody pronounced it, eventually you could say the word God. But you'd have no ability to know what that idea meant. Okay? Not... So your battle for integration is basically learning how to lift your head, which a baby, a newborn, cannot do. There are all kinds of things a newborn cannot do that all require, like, time so that you can integrate the, the, your eyes and your ears and your nose. Your, your senses are not integrated. And your body's not integrated. All of your body parts are there and formed and out and alive, but they're really not integrated. Especially they're not integrated with your brain. And even your skull. When you're first born, your skull is real soft. I've still got the depressions in the sides of my head from the forceps. I was one of those forceps babies. And I've still got the depressions in my head from the forceps. That's how soft your skull is. And it, it lasts. It stays forever. Okay? And... So, there's so many things that have to integrate physically. And then your brain has to, like, learn to control your body. And your first year is basically spent that way. You can't understand a thing you hear. You can mimic the sounds. But you don't know what they are. And you really don't know mama and dada. Or whatever you call them. You really don't know what the meaning of those words are. But you learn to say them. You get familiar with faces, you see. But you can't even really focus. I don't remember how long it takes. I want to say it takes up to a year before your eyes can even focus. Okay? So the battle for integration begins at birth. And then it goes on, you know, uh, all the way through eternity. In eternity, we're all going to be busy learning how to integrate with each other, integrate with the knowledge we get of God every day that's increasing, integrate with our new life, and everything will be new every single day. And it will really be a lot like here. Because so many people are choosing not to know him. So there's got to be some kind of really labor-intensive, low, slow culture. Now, it was mostly like that in this world, even, for thousands of years. You could argue, and a lot of people have tried to argue, that the last 50 or 100 years, a lot of the unrest that we have now is due to the fact that the change occurred too quickly. Technological change occurring too quickly. You can make that argument. I'm, you know, but there's nothing you can do about it. It's here. Man can't be happy until he's dead. He can't find sufficient satisfaction out of pleasure and pain. Because there's a kind of satisfaction you can have in pain. Okay, there's a kind of appreciation that you can have from the meaning of a thing, whether it hurts or feels good. And the whole goal is to graduate from being a baby who needs everything to feel good all the time to a mature person who needs everything to have a meaning. See, maturation, the more you mature, the more what's important to you is the meaning not the feeling, which requires knowledge, which requires truth, which requires acceptance of truth. That's a lot of integrations that have to occur. Therefore, the battling is huge. Okay, but we all get there at different points. So the battle for integration is going to go on forever. Starting out empty and then getting filled up. And that's the Greek words for it. And that's why you need to be filled up with the Holy Spirit so that the right building pieces, as it were, building blocks can get built in your soul the right way and in the right order. Just keep using 1 John 1 9 like breathing. I just used it just now. 
so that the building of your soul can work in the right way. Really. And they don't teach this in the pulpits. If you're not filled with the Spirit, all you're filling yourself up with is hot air and new thought patterns that are going in bad directions. When I say bad, I mean if you knew what they were, you wouldn't want them. But with the Holy Spirit, you know, it, between sins, if you're using 1 John 1 9 a lot, then you're between sins a lot. And then he's the one connecting the dots in your soul so that you're building a thought pattern that's like Christ. And without doctrine, of course, that's not going to happen. That's why you have to live and learn. You have to use 1 John 1 9, find your right teacher, and he'll know who that is and he'll make sure you know. And then live and learn on Bible as much as possible. You don't even worry about whether the teacher's getting it right. God assigned that teacher to you. You just learn what he says. It's just like school. You know, in school, you got teachers. Not all the teachers are like, you know, the brightest people in the book. And not all the teachers are teaching you correct information. But you learn what they teach, and you go with what they teach. And then later, after you graduated, then you can correct what they taught you wrong. Like in my high school textbook, okay, and I want to say it was like 1962, 63. They, they teach a lot of lies. Evolution, okay, um, that the exodus occurred under Ramses, which is around 1200 BC. Big lie. We have proof that it didn't occur then. In the Bible and outside the Bible. Why would they lie like that? Because they're using Cecil B. DeMille's movie rather than real scholarship. Okay, but if you're a child in school and a child under your parents, whatever they tell you, you use that. It doesn't mean you have to believe in it, but you go with it. And then when you're older, when you graduate, you can go back and fix. All right, well, the same thing is true for teachers of Scripture. God will graduate you from one to the next, or maybe he puts you under one that, you know, you're supposed to stay with all the time and never get past. He'll let you know. And you learn and live on Bible under that teacher, and you go to God with what you're learning, because the pastor is not going to get all of it right. And it doesn't matter that he doesn't. The process is being built. That's the big thing. The process of integration is being built. And that's a battle, too. Okay? It's a really big battle. So... You know, here we're talking now about how the battle for integration starts individually. And you could say the same thing as I said in the last increment. Collectively, is that everybody's going through this process collectively. And so you can see the rise and fall of nations based on how well the battle of integration is going. Because when the battle of integration is going well, People are interested in Bible. They develop, as it were, certain cultural norms and processes which allow people to get Scripture, allow people to think about faith matters and talk about them. It doesn't mean that the politics are, have any association at all. Just in private life. And it becomes a sort of cultural thing. It is not part of politics because people don't are interested in God not in politics they're interested in politics because you know we got to have a country we got to have rules we got to have regulations and politics are about the pros and cons of whatever the proposals are but they don't involve faith in God except to keep it free and then you have a sort of how do you want to call it there's a kind of homogenization that's a form of integration. There's a kind of homogenization that takes place in the populace. They grow past 
needing to be proud of their race or their gender or their tribe or their ethnic background. Those are all childish things. And they progress to principles. Rule of law. How, you know, you're dealing with me. I'm dealing with you. If you say you'll do something, you actually keep your word. If I say I'm doing something, I actually keep my word. And that's not merely morality. If it's, if it's really growing well. If the battle of integration is being won, a person is choosing to do something or keep his word or be, you know, what do you want to call it, well-mannered. Not because it's expected, but because he believes in the idea based on Bible. And he's not wearing his Christianity on his sleeve. He just, he just finds the whole idea attractive. Now, there were periods in history in various countries around the world throughout time that this was a motive of a pretty large number of people. They were attracted to the ideas. And initially, it was due to the fact that it was an idea that God had in the Bible. This happened to the Jews at certain periods in their history. Okay, like under David is a good example. Um, it happened to England, all right, at certain periods in her history. It happened to France and Germany and even Russia but for a lesser period of time. Okay, Russia's got a really troubled history. It happened in China. It's happening now, too. The very fact that the Chinese government has, uh, what do you want to call it, licensed churches is a big thaw in the government being wary about Christianity. That, that's a real big move on you know, China's part. I wouldn't be worried about the fact that those are licensed churches. I would go to them if they had the good teachers. Because you can teach real Bible doctrine. It's not, you know, it's not prohibited at all. What they don't want is they don't want a lot of private, they don't want groups meeting in private. That's all they care about. Because there's a long history of groups meeting in private in order to foment conspiracy against the government. That's all they care about. So that's why they license churches. Okay, fine. But the real Bible says you don't mess in politics. You don't try to overthrow the government. That's Romans 13 through 15. And you're, if you think you should overthrow the government, or, oh, we got all these bad people, we should, you know, rebel and, and fire on Washington and la, la, la. Boy, oh, boy, are you in trouble with God. There's a lot of talk among Christians like that in the United States. It's totally sick. Oh, this is supposed to be a Christian nation and we're supposed to fight and, you know, we got these really nasty people in Washington now and, and we should just, you know, um, bomb them or kill them or assassinate. You do that, honey, and you'll be at the bottom of heaven. God does not approve of that. What do you think Christ said? Okay, those who take up the sword, and he means in revolution or rebellion, will die by the sword. That's not the American so-called revolution. America declared itself to be an independent state, independent country. Because we were being taxed, but not represented. So it was illegal for Britain to have to claim rights over the ter over the colonies. Okay, so we and instead of declaring war, instead of rebelling against Britain, we just said, "Hi, we're independent of you now." And then Britain didn't like that, so they sent over soldiers at that point. Why? Because we were a good source of income for them. And so we had to fight for our freedom, but we declared it first. We didn't go to war against them. This was not like the French Revolution, which was totally wrong. Okay? But those, if you'll notice, are all battles for integration. Which way do you go? Okay? It starts out with you not knowing anything. And then you learn all these words. 
You don't know what they mean. You can say them. Especially with Bible. And then you gradually, very gradually, come to have some idea of the meaning of words. And you practice using those words. And after you've had uh, five, six, seven years of that, you actually start to have a personality of your own. Because until you have vocabulary, you can't think. And until you can think, you don't have a personality. You're just a sponge. Now, your average human being gets real tired real fast of trying to learn anything. And gets real hooked real fast on feeling. To the extent that you operate on feeling rather than meaning, you are retarded. And I don't mean that, you know, I don't mean organically retarded. I mean mentally retarded in the sense of you're letting your emotion determine your life rather than meaning determine your life. And you're a real drain on society. You do not mature. You cannot think. You're run by emotion. And you're integrating with it rather than the way God intended with meaning. Therefore, you're not going to grow spiritually. Not because God can't make you grow spiritually, but because you don't want to. Now, that is real important in, you know, feeding back to the last increment where you can tell when a whole populace in the battle of integration if it's going well or badly. Because when it's going badly, you have people voting for like an Obama as if he was the Messiah. And the poor guy finally had to say, I'm not the Messiah. He was my senator when they tapped in the run for president. He had barely been a senator. He had no idea what it would be like. Okay? None. Zero. Totally unfit for office. And even said so. He didn't want to run. I feel really sorry for him, actually. Okay, I, I don't like any of his policies, or most of the ones that I know, anyhow. And I, I'm i really, really upset that he withdrew our troops. He has no understanding of the Middle East. Absolutely none. And all of his policies are anti-Semitic. And he didn't mean them to be, which tells you everything about him. He didn't know what he was doing. So he wasn't integrated. But the lesson about him isn't so much him... But our over 50% of the electorate, just popular vote now, voted for him. Or about 50%. It was kind of neck and neck there. Now, the difference was not very much between him and Mitt Romney. I want to say it was like, I don't know, half a million votes, less than that. I have to go back and look it up. But I was really astonished um, that his election versus Romney was so close. And I think that was also true the first time with McCain, who was not a candidate we should have ever picked. Okay. The guy was just... That means 50% of our country was a bunch of emotional wrecks. 50% of our country was not capable of thinking beyond their emotions. So they're all very immature, not at all integrated with meaning. Because if you had five cents worth of brains, you would have realized this guy needs time. I feel really sorry for him because if he had actually gone into the Senate and maybe had one or two terms as a senator, a lot of his ideas would be different. He would have matured in them, and I, I wouldn't be surprised if he would have maybe switched to being a Republican. He had a lot of potential the first time he ran. And I'm really sorry that, you know, that his life sort of was cut short. He could have made a great Republican, and he probably would have, if, he, if he'd just been allowed to mature in his own ideas rather than have to toe the party line. 
But that's where we are now. And he was hailed as a messiah. What kind of nonsense is that? How immature do you have to be? So my country is immature. At least 50% of it is so immature that it it's boggles the mind. And of course that's reflected in our TV programs, in our conversations, in the comments. And now we have the Republican equivalent of Obama running. With also no experience. His name is Donald Trump. And he's a lot older. And okay, he's got some possible savvy. Because he knows something about business. But you know what? What it takes to run a government is very different from what it takes to run a business. Businesses are based on economics. Governments have to be based on ideology. And very often times, good politics is bad economics. That's part of the reason why you have government. Government is expected to be a loss leader. Government's job is to do what the economy, what the private sector cannot do. And what makes good government is good ideology. Trump doesn't have good ideology. He doesn't have any ideology. He flips this way, then that way, then this way, then that way, then this way, then that way, depending on what's expedient. That's exactly what everybody's complaining about. About Congress, about the Senate, about the House. Oh, here we finally have the Republicans in power, and they're flipping back and forth like Democrats. Yeah, what do you think Trump's going to do? That's his background. He contributed to the Democrats. He contributed to Obama. He contributed to Hillary. But the Trump people who support him don't do their homework. And they're praising him in the same terms as the Democrats did Obama. They're praising Trump in the same way. And Trump is just as, you know, what do you want to call it? just as ill-fitted to the job. And what kind of support is he going to have? They're not Republicans. So he's running on a Republican ticket, but he's not a Republican. Nominally. And yet everybody who supports him says that all the other Republicans are the ones who are Republican in name only, a.k.a. Rhino. It's actually Trump who's a Republican in name only. But they can't tell that. So their immaturity level, because they like the way he talks, because he's flamboyant. Yeah, he's interesting because he talks that way. His flamboyance is a nice, refreshing change. We're, you know, tired of the mealy mouth. But in good politics, you have to be mealy mouth. So that guy gets elected and it it's going to be a disaster. Because my people perish. What was it? He just threw that. What what, what? Hosea 64 or 46. My people perish for lack of doctrine. The actual verse is lack of knowledge, but it it's that at and it means truth knowledge, which of course means doctrine. Okay? My people perish for lack of truth. Knowledge in your head that's truth. And that's what they're doing. They're drooling. The media is drooling over Trump. On both sides of the aisle. It's, cr it's just unbelievable. The guy's dominating the entire political debate. Why? Because he's somewhat attractive. Because he's different. Because he's flamboyant. Because we, the people, have no character. And you don't have character when you're six and seven and five years old. Your character hasn't formed yet. You don't have enough vocabulary. You don't know how to think yet. 
which means that America is full of babies. And look at the topics. See, I'm, I'm going through this because, you know, the election's happening. This is like January 12th of 2016. But the bigger reason, the bigger reason I'm going through this is to show you the diagnostic elements when you're looking at the battle of integration and how it's going in your world, in your nation, in your area. What is the focus of interest? And what causes the interest that people show? Well, it's all bathroom stuff. Hillary argues with Trump about Bill Clinton's infidelities. And that's going to be considered a proper topic for national debate? It was 20 freaking years ago. Was Clinton wrong? Yeah. Everybody knew that then. But it's not an issue now. Why should it be an issue now? we got some real problems going on. World War III has started, and nobody's aware of it yet. Just like when World War I started, they weren't aware of it then. Only in hindsight can you look back and see that. we got the exact same elements that started World War I going on. What caused World War I? An event happened far away. One crazy guy shot a royal guy named Archduke Ferdinand. That of itself shouldn't have caused anything except, you know, a lot of hand wringing. But it ended up causing World War I because behind the scenes there were all of these little agreements and treaties and lining up in alliances and, you know, Oh, we'll go with you if you go against them and we'll go with you if you go against them well the same thing is true in the Middle East right now and when ISIS did its thing on the centenary of World War I taking Mosul or thereabouts which was about the end of July of 2014 which is when World War I broke out in um 1914 when ISIS did that all the little alliances that are surreptitious within the Middle East and outside it are they're all starting all the pieces are starting to move in place now so how does that happen childishness of the people there is no reason whatsoever that the world should have gone to war over some crazy guy shooting Archduke Ferdinand. No reason at all. The guy was acting on his own. He was not the agent of some other country. It was not designed to start a war, but it sure did. Because people wanted the pretext. They want the pretext now. The way Donald Trump is talking, honey, if it didn't start last July, it's going to. He wants to take the oil in the Middle East. He thinks he can just walk in there and bomb whatever and take the oil and see, we're getting paid for it. Yeah, that's how a businessman ought to think. That's not how a, sta a head of state should be thinking. Not if you value your country staying alive. Because we don't have what it takes to fight this war yet. We're too childish. But, oh boy, you know, all the Trump people are, rah, rah, Trump, rah, rah, Trump, he's going to save us. He's going to make a great America great again. Never mind that he never says how. Never mind that what he does say is cause for great alarm. Because he clearly doesn't understand the situations. This guy is an absolute foreign policy disaster. You think Obama was bad for the Middle East? You think Obama screwed up with respect to Israel? You ain't seen nothing yet. Trump is so much worse for Israel, it's not even funny. And he, and he, he talks down to them. It's just, it's just... The only person's worse to elect would be Hillary or any of the Democrats. 
Now, a mature person can see all that because a mature person knows what a mature foreign policy is supposed to be like. A mature person can see what a mature voter is supposed to be like and can see all these baby voters out there. And some of them are actually physically babies. I mean, you know, they're just newly 18, 19, 20. They're just about to enter college. And, you know, that Donald Trump makes them feel good. But he doesn't have the, the people behind him. Or I can't find that he has the right people behind him. Because his website is written by an idiot. The positions that he uses, either he wrote it himself and had very little editing, or his son or one of his sons edited it, or somebody... But somebody wasn't doing his homework because either wholesale copies, you know, Jeb Bush on certain things, or Ted Cruz, or Rand Paul, or <clears throat> the way it's worded and the ideas in there, especially on immigration, are just, and China, absolute buck kiss. And I did the dump Trump video so you know. But the point I'm trying to make here is not so much Trump. But when you see a wacko like that running for office and he's popular and very likely to win, then you know your nation is in trouble. Then you know your nation is integrating away from God. Because a lot of the people who support Trump just like the people who support Cruz, another really bad candidate for office. They're mostly Christians. They're mostly white, conservative Christians who have a real axe to grind with respect to non-whites. I'm not 100% sure you could just call it prejudice, but it's not too far off. They're really supporting those two. So Christians don't know their Bible. They're not integrated with God. They're not integrated with their Bible. And of course, Jews typically aren't either. They're, they tend to be liberals anyhow. They wouldn't know the Bible if it bit them. There's no way you can be a Jew knowing the Bible and be liberal. It's not possible. So between all of those libtards... And the idiots who want to vote for Trump, you're talking now 60-70% of the country who's like mentally age 12. Just wanting to rebel. That's really it. They're voting for Trump because they want to rebel. Well, that's what you do when you're 12. So the battle of it, the integration battle... If eternity started tomorrow, if the rapture hit tomorrow, this particular generation, this particular population, even if we were all saved, pretend, then you're talking about one out of a million. Who have any kind of maturity to speak of. One out of ten million. Uh, it's it's frightening to think just how many of us, as my pastor would have put it, could qualify as Jashurin right now. Because he finally decided that that's the only reason why the U.S. is still a country. There's no pivot anymore, as he called it. Pivot would mean at least 5 to 10 percent of Christians are actually growing in spiritual life. Specifically to adulthood. And he said, no, nah, I... I I remember him saying it. I saw him. He said, I'm no longer recruiting for the pivot. That was in 1997 in Michigan. I saw him say that. And I'm like, wow, it's that bad. And he thought that the U.S. had like 40 years left to live. I wonder what he'd say now if he was still alive. So much of what he, he said every year he'd make predictions and they kept coming true. And there were, you know, his predictions aren't like, oh, God is giving me a revelation. No, he's using Bible doctrine like he's supposed to. You're supposed to make predictions too. All of us are. That's what a good ruler does. 
I wonder what he'd say now. How, how many of us are holding the U.S. together? And he was trying to figure that out. Is it 10, 50, 100? And I want to say, and I could be wrong about this, and to those of you who you know, are under him also, correct me where I'm wrong, but I want to say he said that it would take like 50 or 100 mature believers in the United States, because you have to be a mature believer to be in the Jeshurun class, 50 to 100 of them could save it. I'm not even sure it's that many. And he was trying to base that on the ratio of Moses. Moses was one to six million. And then later there came Joshua and Caleb. So that was three to six million. And the estimate of the six million is based on, you know, two million adults and then assuming that each had two kids. That could be, you know, totally wacko off base. Because a lot of them were converts who were Egyptians. Okay. But the point is, is that, okay, if it's one to six million, and this country has 300 million, then that's not real good. Okay? 300 divided by six. Okay? 24 divided by six is four. 300 divided by six would be what? 50? Okay, so it could be 50. Are there 50 mature believers in the United States? And what does that tell you if that's all there are? And what level of maturity does it have to be? I don't really know. I, you know, and here's an important application to make of this. Since we don't know, and we also don't know what threshold of maturity it is, assume, this is crazy now, but do it, assume you're one of them. I have to assume I'm one of them. Because if you don't, you'll, send, you'll tend to think, oh, I'm too low, I'm not going to get there, and you know, basically, you know, shirk the responsibility. Because how do you know that God isn't looking at you based on where you could go and preserving the nation so that you have enough time to get there? See? So it isn't necessarily right this second, Jeshurun, you're mature enough, but you can be. You can be in that 50, but you're not there maybe today. I mean, because he was speculating about all this, that, you know, that there's a doctrine, a real doctrine called Jeshurun in the Bible, and he traced it. But, you know, God's eye is very long, and he could look at you where you are today and say, okay, I'm going to grant the United States a little longer to live because I know where you are going to go in your maturation you know, two years from now, five years from now, ten years from now. So you have to assume that, oh, I'm in the 50. Because you might be. Maybe not today. But tomorrow. Let's pretend I'm in the 50 now, and that's a pretty good assumption. I'm 62. I'm not going to live forever. Maybe you're 30. And maybe you're my replacement. See the point? You got a current crop of Jeshurun today, but we die. I could die tomorrow. Or worse, I could get negative to God tomorrow, spin off outside the spiritual life, die a loser, and be at the bottom. So whatever Jeshurun status I might have right this second, I could lose tomorrow. So then, who's going to replace me? Could be you. And we don't even necessarily know each other. You might be hearing this years after I'm dead. 
Could be him. See the point? See where all this battle of integration, the, the, the kind of vicissitudes involved in it, and how you can diagnose, oh my gosh, the United States is in deep doo-doo. And we might not be a nation. I mean, 1997, he thought we had 40 years left. That's 2037. It's now 2015. For all I know, we only got 22 years left as a nation. They, you know, people think, oh, that can't happen, really. People didn't think China could fall, either. People didn't think Russia could fall, either. Okay? The big companies that have been falling in the United States, companies that have been around for a long time, Kmart, and then you had shorter run companies like Enron, Arthur Anderson had been around for years. And one little problem with Enron felled it, killed it. Goldman Sachs was in trouble. Chrysler Motors. A lot of companies that should have been around have been either bankrupted or nearly. It's like, how can this happen? Well, it happens when you got a lot of babies at the top. And Microsoft, I wouldn't give you two cents for their stock. They're run by cretins. The people at the top in Microsoft, they just should all be fired, including all the whole board of directors. Those people can't think their way out of a paperback. They're completely ruining the company. Completely. Ever since Windows 8. Actually, ever since that stupid ribbon in Microsoft Office Professional in 2007. Maybe even before that, 2003. Ever since they came out with Vista. The, and, and when you listen to their leaders talk, they talk in circles. They don't make any sense. They talk like politicians do, mouthing words. And then after it's done, it's like, what did he say? So, see, you, you've got a rottenness all throughout society in America. A childish rottenness because they didn't grow up so they're not integrating so the integration battle is going south going bad so when you look at your particular country and I'm sorry I use the old, you know United States is all I know okay what I know about other countries is too little to make this kind of example if you look at your own country and it's directions in its politics in its culture in its interests in the stuff that's popular you'll be able to tell if your country's going toward integration specifically with God or away from it and if away then more imp there's more importance in you spiritually growing than normal it's always important it's always best for your own life. But there's a political dimension to it. An invisible political dimension where you are going to be used by God to hold your country together as Jeshurun. So grow harder. Talk to God about this seriously because there are going to be a lot of changes over the next 20 years. And I really don't know if the U.S. is going to survive it. Peace out.